Hi there, I'm Joe Partavila from Advantage Forbes Books. The Specialist Pipeline book is a groundbreaking work. This is the first time we see a book introducing a structured approach on how to design a specialist architecture that both offers a real career framework for specialists and addresses the crucial transition that specialists have to complete in order to successfully move from one level to another. But what's really the problem to be solved for organizations with this book? To address that question, I've invited Kent Jonason, author of the Specialist Pipeline book and CEO of Leadership Pipeline Institute, to put some more words on the organizational value proposition of the Specialist Pipeline concept. Kent, welcome back to the show. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's talk challenges and let's talk the number three, because everyone likes the number three, things in three. So what are three of the challenges you've experienced in working with organizations related to specialists? So, uh, so the challenges that the organizations are trying to, you can say, fix yeah. uh, uh, working with this, the top three is probably uh, the fierce fight for, uh, for specialist talent. Uh, so the thing is that if I'm sitting there as a specialist and I feel I can do my job here, I can do my job here, or in a third company, then it all comes down to money. And then you start competing just on money. Okay. So I think that that's a major thing where companies say to themselves and ask themselves, you know, how can we avoid just to compete? Not that we don't want to pay them good money, but I mean, if you just compete on money, then, then we end in a war for talent uh, 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 on, on this one. Another thing, a, a key challenge that companies are addressing with the specialist pipeline, that has really been too many specialists are pursuing people manager careers in order to have a career. Oh. Because if you only work with the leadership pipeline thinking, then you do different passages as a leader. But if you're never a leader, then you always end up in the bottom. Mm. If you visually just look at that, Whereas if you're next to the leadership pipeline draws the specialist pipeline, then you realize, oh, we can grow together and I could also jump across, actually. So that's the second challenge that I normally see companies are trying to fix uh, with this one. Uh, it's the thing, avoid that. The third part uh, is probably, it's adjacent to the second part. Many companies, they want to delayer, So they want to get rid of too many people managers. <laughs> and then they realize, wow, we have hundreds of people managers who have only one or two direct reports. How does that make sense? Wow. That makes perfect sense. Because now we're back to the point I just made. It's somebody who at a certain stage said, but hey, Kent, uh, I really need to keep Kent in the company. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to make him a manager of two people because then he can in increase in job grades. He can get a different title and I can give him more money and then he can stay. Then it gives me one or two people. And now you're a team leader, now you're a people manager. So they have used these things to keep people and, mm. and, and retain people in the organization. But all of a sudden, there are 200 managers who did that. <laughs> and now we have 200 managerial roles with one or two direct reports. It's not good for the specialist, it's not good for the manager of, of this person, it's not good, it's not good for anybody. Mm. But it is what happens when you run thin of what can I do. And, and what companies are then doing is they are they're fixing this now with the specialist pipeline concept, so they don't run thin again. It's not like they go from 200 to zero yeah. <laughs> of these roles, but they go from 200 to maybe 25 Got of it. these types of roles. Those are the typical challenges, three most typical challenges that I see that companies are trying to fix okay. with the specialist pipeline concept. Let's circle back to the first one, the war on talent, which here in the United States, uh, much has been discussed about the great resignation and this war on talent has just been elevated. What have you seen in terms of this war on talent with specialists before and after the pandemic? Yeah. Has it been, is it just out of control, this war on talent? Well, one of the reasons that it's more out of control, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really, now people have gotten used to work from home. Now, before this, one of the main retainers of people in a company is my team. I'm coming in to the office, sitting with my team. I have a personal relationship to my team. But now I've been home for two years, or however long. So I've gotten used to, I can actually have a good life without being together with my team. Some may not, some have gotten used to say that I really need my team yeah. to have a good life. But a lot of people have gotten used to, I can actually have a good life. So it doesn't matter where I work. And a lot of companies have gotten used to, I don't need people to sit in the office. And that means now I sit in California and I can hire someone in South Carolina. I sit in New York, I can hire someone wherever it is. And this means that the mobility of specialists, it's much, much, much bigger. In the, maybe also for people managers, but definitely for specialists, the mobility is now much bigger. 
uh, great for the specialist, but a huge challenge uh, uh, for the companies. And I mean, I know, I know you expect to fix all these problems, but how do we? How does that sort of level off? Is it just going to be now this continuous challenge of like whether the specialist wants to work from home or? because they have so much freedom to like say work in multiple states wherever they want to is is this sort of just the future of the specialists in in and actually workers in general um fair enough it's 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 hard to predict the future but <laughs> uh one thing that is uh the most dangerous thing in my opinion in this case is to believe things are going to go back to, to normal. normal right if you do that, then you're probably in, in, in trouble uh, because the future is always changing. Mm. Uh, so in this case, that's the major challenge that you believe that things will go back to normal. It will not. So, so the thing here is you cannot predict everything, but you can make a bet. And one of the bets we are experiencing that companies are now making is, OK, if we make it attractive for specialists for other reasons uh, to stay and remain in this company mm. beyond coming into a team because that, uh, that may not be that important anymore, and all the other things, then the specialist pipeline framework is one of the things that can help specialists to really feel mm -hmm. that this is important. And I'll give you an example. Yes. Let's take an example. How many companies, and uh, uh, those of you looking at this video, <laughs> try, and <ask> yourself, <laughs> try and ask yourself about this in your company, in your company, right? So, do you have an annual leadership forum, an annual leadership meeting where top 50, top 100, top 300 are together? Yeah, of course we have to. Okay, do you have an annual specialist forum? Do you have an annual specialist team where you put the top 100 specialists together? And I'm sure that all of you, you will say no. But you see, who wants to be a specialist? I'm not important. Do you have structured leadership development mm -hmm. programs? Now, have had, that are maybe different levels, but still? Yeah, we do that. Do you have structured specialists? No. So you see, there are many easy pieces where you can actually help specialists feel equal to people manager. Mm. And, and I'm, now I'm just saying be feeling equal because and a better question to ask yourself is maybe also who's actually more important, the people <laughs> manager or the specialist? So, and we're just, we just even out with this, but maybe we should even go here. Mm. That part I'm not contributing with, with this book, but what I'm contributing with with this book is at least we even out so now we're secure that, that this can work much better for the specialist in the future. Great. And of course, one day you can argue, but what if everybody are implementing this? Then, <laughs> then it's not going to help you. No, but then just get, get, do it very fast, because then at least you're ahead <laughs> of everybody else. Right? Be first. Be an early adopter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. All right. So you talked about those three challenges. Um, and we went into the, mm. the, the, the first one pretty heavily. But uh, what are the consequences of those three? Like, if people experience those three issues that we were discussing, how bad are, can things get? Yeah. So if you take this thing about uh, uh, attra attracting and retaining, um, it's easy to calculate money here. What is our retention rate? What is our resignation rate? What does it cost to find a new specialist? What does it cost us in a period of time where we don't have this specialist? So I was working with an, an, an oil and gas company, uh, and uh, then you have one of these people analyzing the reservoirs and so on. Uh, then, uh, well, that was a she. Then she resigned. And, and so on, and the project stopped for three months. Uh, after three months, they had to go out to a consultancy company and then rent in expertise to wow. do that, which is uh, three times the price of, of the salary of that person. So it just stops. That's the challenge with specialists. So the money attached to not being good at attracting and developing specialists is, is uh, severe. Mm -hmm. The other part is, today I'm sure if you sit at a people review in your company, then you can ask yourself, okay, where, where do we have some specialists that at their level are performing good that we could promote? But also ask yourself, did they get there by chance? Or was it a structured, supported process that got them there? And most of you will probably answer, they got there by chance. But can we live with that? Yeah. Can we actually live with that, that it's by chance we have qualified specialists two, three, seven years from now? We cannot do this by chance. So you got a business strategy. You need to look at that business strategy and say, what are the consequences for the number, the quality, and the type of specialist we need three years from now in order to execute on that business strategy? And then you start building a pipeline that supports you getting there. There are no guarantees, but if you don't do it, there is one guarantee. You're only going to get there by chance. Mm. And that's not a good strategy. 
And in terms of industries, you, you mentioned one. Are the challenges uh, across industries are they similar, or are they as every you know every vertical different? Right. So I would say what is different among industries. Um, uh, if you took retail compared to a software development company, then the percentages of specialists in the software development company versus in a retail business, it's, it's, it's seven times higher or something like that. So for them, the specialists become more important because it, that's the heart of the business, the specialists there, right? So, but if you then look at, okay, so, but what if I look at the specialist pipeline after it's implemented, how different is it? That's not very different. Mm -hmm. uh, one company here may have four layers, the other may only have two or three layers because they are less specialist heavy, uh, but they still have some of the layers in the specialist pipeline. They still need to address the transitions and so on. So that's the same across, but, it, but, but, but fair enough, the importance of specialists can be different in different companies. Okay, so uh, I wanna know what the big takeaway of the book is in terms of the effect it will have on a company, the leaders, if they decide to read it. What do you think if, a, someone, a, a senior leader in a company decides to read the book and uh, they, they, re, they take down notes, they, they take so much information as they can from it. What, what kind of outcome do you think some of these companies will have if they decide to put a lot of these things into action? Sure. Well, I, I can refer to a specific case where, where I personally have been part of it. Uh, so a large uh, global pharmaceutical company uh, recently uh, implemented this uh, um, within the part of the organization. and. The entire energy around being a specialist in this organization completely changed. Wow. That, that's one thing about being a specialist completely changed, the entire energy around it. It was really this thing about, wow, now we are as important. That's one thing. The other thing was the people managers. When they got trained in how to lead through specialists, meaning setting objectives at the right level, structure development, all this stuff, when they got trained in that, they, st they started having completely different conversations about specialists. Mm -hmm. When you, you go into a people review, it became fact-based conversations about how is she performing as a knowledge expert, knowledge leader, whatever. It became fact-based conversations. Instead of, she's a good specialist, she's a good specialist. What does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. You can't ask that question. No, by the way, <laughs> by the way. So it doesn't mean anything. So this thing about the manager starting, and, and also the manager starting having to, they could look at it and say, look, I don't have a knowledge leader role for you, but what you need to be a knowledge leader, if you want to be that one day, are these five things. And I can actually offer to expose you to these two things. So now somebody's sitting here, they know that's not a knowledge leader job in my area, in this part of the organization, but I'm actually now being developed on my potential to one day, and, and it, kept them in the job because now they were motivated wow. and they realized I actually like my job, I actually like my team, I just need something, here's the something. But the managers couldn't give it before because they didn't have this language and this insight to give it to the specialist. This is, I mean, ask somebody in this company, to say they would say the two same things and maybe other things, right? Because it's so visible inside the organization. Mm. It's funny, because I know this book is very technical, but and I'm not, don't, not sure if it's intentional or not, but this could have a huge impact on culture of a company. Was that intentional, that you thought it would have a, a cultural impact as well as not just a technical impact of the company? Yeah, I would actually, yeah, yes, actually, yes. Um, culture is such a big word, word so I've not used it much yeah, that's in the, the book. I know, that's, that's why I was wondering. Because I think it's so big and everybody talks culture, but reality is, for, for 20 years, at least those 20 years where I've been in this, 25 years in this industry, everybody have talked about building a leadership culture. That's great. I'm just asking, how about a specialist culture? Would you have, like to have that too? Uh, can that be combined? And that's the beautiful part. Mm. You can combine, it's not like, no, we can only have one culture. You have different cultures in an organization. You have right. a leadership culture. That's about how are we as leaders doing things? Specialist culture, how are we as specialists doing mm. things? So these things can coexist. It's not like you have to pick one over the other. Yeah, and and it seems like from that example, the pharmaceutical company, it had a huge impact on its culture, right? It's because it sounded like there was something a little off there, but now that's changed, especially amongst the specialists. Yeah, it was it was off, yes, but it was actually uh, unrecognized off until when they then look at the specialist pipeline and say, oh, now I see 
why I have this problem. Yeah. So it was kind of a diagnostic tool for them to see, okay, now we know why it hurts these five places in our organization. Now we know why it hurts uh, there. And by the way, we also know what to do about it, right? Uh, but you feel the pain. It's just that, oh, where is it coming from? It's like, oh, I have something in my arm. But if you know the body, then you know it's because there's something in your back <laughs> yeah. that causes the pain in the arm. But if you don't know your body mm. and anything about that, then, oh, it's hurting in my arm. Yeah, that's where you feel the pain. Uh, but the problem is somewhere else. Uh, that That's kind of the leadership pipeline thinking. Wow. It's going to help you find the real problem. <laughs> yeah, and culture, but you know, <laughs> it's yeah. too big a word. I, I get what you're saying. I'd rather say there are so many people and so many authors using culture. Yeah. So I, I just stayed away from it and say, hey, let's just get a hands on approach, a real hands on approach mm. with hands on language on how to do this stuff. Love it. His name is Kent Jonathan. The book is A Specialist Pipeline. Uh, Kent, thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome.